Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of the Low Code Campfire. This is episode number 60, and uh, today we don't have any particular topic to talk about, so that means it's Open Lines Friday. Um, allow me to introduce myself. I am Dale Warner, head of support for Plant an App. This is an event we do every Friday this hour to uh, just talk about what's going on in low code in general and um, plant an app in specifics. It's a 10, it can be a all skill levels meeting any, any level that you're at. We will uh, welcome you to the meeting, but we tend to talk, get into uh, technical discussions uh, and um, very useful to help out with maybe whatever project you may be working on. All our past editions are recorded and on our YouTube channel at plantanapp.com, youtube.com slash plantanapp. We encourage you to subscribe to that and uh, be able to take advantage of this good content. We run a pretty informal agenda. We say hello and then let's, uh, do a first call, anything that's uh, pressing and on your mind. And then we'll do a, a review of our shared campfire website, Take a look at some feature requests, uh, anything that was submitted in advance, which nothing submitted in advance today. And I, I do have a ghost story to tell, so we'll do that. After an hour or so, we'll, we'll turn off the recording and uh, do Afterglow. It's just an informal discussion. We'll see if anybody has a, a, a t-shirt that they need to show off, stuff like that. But it, this is really informal. Jump in and, and engage with us, please. Uh, few, very few guidelines. Be nice. And uh, also, if you've got noise going on, mute your mic. Uh, you can submit questions and topics in advance to this address. This is also listed on our, uh, in the invitations that, and, uh, that you might receive from us. So submit those things in advance. And with that, I will say hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hey there, Patrick. Good morning, Dale. Good morning, Patrick. Everybody. Mark. Good morning. Can you hear me any better this week? Sorry, sir. I I wondered if you could hear me any better this week. Uh, um, it's it's a little bit low, but I can hear you. So <laughs> good. And. I'll just say I spent an hour on, on a meeting this morning with one of our internal people. My internet has been up and down. So if I don't respond right away, I'm just going to ask Patrick to, to uh, do a little song and dance until I can come back. But um, yeah, it, it's my worst nightmare to be trying to present something and uh, not, uh, ha not have internet. And it seems to be one, the, one of those days. So good. All right. Um, so first call, anybody have anything important or high on your mind that you want to talk about, solve, get an opinion on? I have a, a question about using the read all function in entities. The read all function. Yep. Is it, yeah. Oh, the, the 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 action that returns a uh, um, a JSON list of uh, of all your entities, and you can add a where clause. Is that the one you're talking about? Right. So each entity gets generated. Um, each entity, when you generate it, you have a a an action that's generate created to mm -hmm. read all. Yep. And. I don't get anything back from that ever. I can run a SQL statement and get data back. There's a I get an empty to empty token back when I yeah. The, so the there's a little trick to that. Um, and uh, Dale, I apologize if you were <laughs> getting ready to say something. Please but, jump in. Um, uh, so, um, and I'm I'm not sure why this is, but I think it's uh, um, it's worth. Uh, Dale may be us taking a note of it to explore it um, more, but you have to add um, colon JSON to the token and it'll return to the JSON list. Okay. Did you try that already or were you just using the... I was, I was expecting it giving me, that it was giving me a list back. And so, so that um, 
I was trying to use it like it was a list. Oh, like it was a list. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that, and that makes sense that you would expect that. And, um, and, uh, I think maybe, uh, um, if it's, it, it, and I suspect maybe it was intended to work that way, but, um, uh, and maybe we just need to explore what might be wrong there. But, um, when, whenever I use that action, I've always, uh, I always, um, Put it in, in uh, use the JSON, and that's uh, it's the JSON token. So it's the uh, the token that you establish as the output, and then colon JSON. Mm -hmm. Because um, so you would take that JSON then, and then right after it, load the JSON into a list. Is that how you would use it? Yeah. Right. So let's let's take a look at it. Um, easy enough to explore and see what's going on. So I have a, a simple entity that's a list of books. I only have six books, but we can work with that. And so if we were to define a quick workflow, and we'll call this, we'll put it in the campfire namespace and we'll call it um, books. So the entity in question, this is going to be a plant and app. Uh, no, it should be entity. under, yeah, entities, yep. And, and I see I have 384 of these, so I'm not, <laughs> we, we got a lot to, so we, but we have read all books here somewhere. And so when we say read all books and we don't give it a where clause, max number of records, a thousand. So it's going to output, and this is going to be the um, books will be where we put it as a token. But you can see this is what, what he was um, referring to. The You can reference the output and it tells it, uh, explains here where you can get it. So use it as JSON. So we'll do that load entities JSON. I'll bet we've renamed that action. I don't know. Let's. It's probably going to be load list JSON. Can you take a note about that one? Oh yeah. Needs to yeah. be fixed. Uh, actually, let's paste that onto our clipboard here. Um. So it's all books. So we save that, and then we do a it's in our lists create list from json and the json model is all books json so at this point you could iterate through execute action and execute Actions for each list entry on the list. So this is the all books list. And do something then on all books. Does that make sense, Jim? Yes. Yeah, it's it's not clearly evident, so I, I wanted to walk through that. Um, so just to prove that this is going to do something, I'm going to create a, uh, a token here, create a token. It's going to be called book names. Build that up. So for each, for each list of this, we will do a change to book names. It's going to be what book names was before, plus um, this same prefix, right? The no, oh, this is this was syntax was wrong. So I'm glad we came back and did that. The name of the list we, we're not passing the value of the list. We're passing the name of the list, so it didn't need brackets. Um, 
but when we do this, we're going to say all book lists, all book list colon name. Each iteration is going to get um, <clears throat> the name is going to be provided for each one. And, and I'm just going to put a comma here doing a pretty simple output. And before I, I'm going to um, So we can infer this is the name of the field that I want, the name field. So I'll book name, and then we'll go to the end and output the result. And the value we're going to do is outputting the uh, book names. So at the very end, we're outputting book names. From a process standpoint, we created book names here as empty. And in this execute for each, we say that the book names gets the old value of book names plus the current name. And so let's see if this works. We'll save and test and run it. And the output gets all of our names of our books. So that's how to iterate through what comes back from a read all. Well, hopefully that uh, helps. That will solve, solve it. I mean, I, like I said, I was expecting a list and I tried, I misinterpreted that comment about load entities JSON as I was not adding the colon JSON to it. I was passing the token name into the JSON, but that would just give me an error. So yeah. I um, misinterpreted the uh, colon JSON usage. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I would like to see, it, it, it would make sense to me from a product standpoint if we returned a list out of that so that it could be used directly and we didn't have to go to that extra step of, of uh, creating the list. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in our product. Um, in the product meeting next Monday. Bringing that up. Anybody else? Or do you have another one, Jim? I, I think I'm good until after I test upgrading uh, to 1.21. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. I, hi, everybody. Hi, um, Matt. So I have, this is more information. And this was kind of came out of, it really surprised me. So I've got uh, three screens on my monitor. I mean, on my system. One, I'm running Chrome as a, a logged in user. Another one, I'm running uh, Microsoft Edge as the super user. And for reasons that I cannot yet explain, <clears throat> it just happened again this morning, my, one of my instances, and I think it's, it's uh, Edge mostly, when I change a tab or something like that, will come back to me with the Chrome authentication. In other words, I'm logged in as Joe, on Chrome and on Edge, I'm logged in as the super user, but I'd say uh, change tabs or something like that. Suddenly the profile will be for the Chrome user, Joe, which is very strange. So it just, it almost, <laughs> it actually caught me by surprise because I didn't have icons in there for, in DNN for pictures or whatever. Well, I subsequently changed that just to give me a quicker read as to what was going on. So just a point of information. So if you can uh, capture that particular bug, uh, you know, a set of reproducing steps, it would be interesting. It sounds like, um, I mean, if, if that turns out to be the case, 
that bleed over between Chrome and, and uh, Edge would be real unexpected, but also not something that is within, that seems like a, a, a browser problem versus a Planton app. I don't know how we would fix that. Yeah, no, I, I'm not suggesting that it is a Planton app. It may be CNN, it may be browser. My suspicion is browser, but yeah. <laughs> it was a surprise to me. And luckily, it didn't cost me anything other than some confusion and loss of time. But once I figured out what was going on, it was relatively easy to spot. But just for the other folks on here who might be doing similar things that I'm doing, which is kind of typical, yep. um, just be aware. Well, again, if you if you get it down to a list of steps that, hey, I did this and here's what happened, uh, I'd, I'd love to try and reproduce it because yeah, I agree. I, it, would, it would be impactful to our users. Yeah. I, I, if I can, I certainly will then. But it's I know, and almost random. Ra raising the issue, that kind of gets us to be on the lookout for it as well. But. Right. I would feel fairly confident that it is a browser related issue because um, something I do all the time is use uh, Chrome profiles. And uh, I have lots of Chrome profiles that I use for various different purposes. And I've never seen them, you know, different Chrome profiles. I've never seen them miscommunicate like that. Like if I'm logged in as a regular user in one of my Chrome profiles and then as a super user in the other pro Chrome profile, I've never seen any um, uh, uh, mix up communication between them. So uh, I would suspect that somehow um, Edge is uh, is um, yeah, using you know something that's associated with your primary your primary Chrome profile. Yeah, that yeah. Would, I, that does yeah. seem to be you know a reasonable explanation of what might be happening. So yes, possibly. So I'm um, just a quick search. I see that uh, Edge is based on Chromium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But which is a couple, although that article was a couple years old, um, but that makes it then at least plausible that Chrome, that you know they're doing something wrong in Edge to not uh, whether it's sharing it, it that would almost be sharing a cookie, right? Um, because you authenticate to. Mm. Um, DNN using the, the cookies at the site. So it's like they would be using the same cookie. Yeah. It does seem to be that because, again, both users are logged in each browser session. Mm -hmm. And I've not seen it cross contaminate the other way where suddenly Chrome picks up my Edge credentials. Mm -hmm. It bleed over from Chrome to Edge. Not to say it won't happen, but thus far, that's what I've seen. And so I'd have to say that it probably very likely is a browser issue, but. I've seen weird stuff like that happen, but more with single sign-on because you can do profiles in Edge and I use those, I've used those quite a bit and it allows you to sign in. It, it's more an issue when you sign into Microsoft accounts. So yeah. you, can, you can log in. You can log in on different um, Edge profiles. So you might want to try creating a specific Edge profile just for this work. And when you do the when you do single sign-on type sign-ins, um, certainly from Microsoft, you get prompted to say, "Do you want to log in on your system, or do you just want to log into this app?" And that can, if you choose that option, you can isolate it to a single Edge profile. Yeah. But, okay. Um, yeah, I think Microsoft, as usual, is trying to be a bit too clever. Good idea. Thank you. I see an article, a question, somebody asking, and it was this is not a really great answer, but it's uh, it's somebody essentially saying the same thing. They they log out on one browser and they're logged out on the other, and so it does sound like there might be issues where of cross contamination. Cool, good one. I think that that qualifies as a ghost story, so we can we can put it in that category. Yeah, it does. Yeah. All right, I was out of sequence. I no, 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 no. We, <laughs> this is this is informal. I'm not. I wasn't chastising. That was. Uh, this is exactly um, the kind of thing that you know when these scary things that we run into that 
seem to take up a lot of time and they're really not, I don't know, anyway, that's that, no particular, um, no particular order necessary. Anybody else with a, with a first call thing or any comments on anything going on in the Zoom that I've prevent, presented in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, this is Mark. Um, I got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Please. Um, can I share my screen for a sec? I got a Absolutely. question on a presentation of a form. Are we all just seeing a form? Yep, now? we got it. Dashboard? Okay. So um, this might be trivial for most of us, I think, but uh, it's, I don't see the answer to it. I just want to do a pop-up form and that is working as you see. This is a weird thing. Why are the labels for these checkboxes on the next line? Can't seem to influence that. So and when you, go ahead. You first, Dr. Oh, I was just going to ask, what, what do you see when you inspect this? Is I, uh, is there? Because it, it seems like there's probably a um, a div that's not uh, expanding as wide as it should, or something like that. Um, yeah, how can I help you look at that? Um, it's well, actually, it's really if you can make this. Uh, um, smaller and then you know as you mouse over the the different elements um, we'll we'll look at the screen and that probably will and uh, go down to the div that's below the label that's the error holder yep there is a margin top. yeah what was that it's a margin top there Yeah, I see that. Oh, interesting. So hmm. you must have added that in the settings, maybe. Take a look at that. The, um, like Matt's example, I've got that going on in a different browser. I'm logged in as a user in the other one. There's no settings, and there's which one visible. It says custom CSS there, so that's yep, there it is. <laughs> okay, good catch. Thank you. <laughs> I know what to do about that. Okay. Um, so so next one. This is a new BS5 form. Um, I would like to be able to take a section of the form, like this assignment day section, including title and uh, three fields below it. And I'd like to maybe give that a different background color just to set it uh, visually apart from the rest of the form. Is that possible? And how would I approach that? Dynamic forms, maybe dynamic fields. So then I would set the background color of the dynamic field container. Is that what you're suggesting? I was just throwing the idea I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did this. I'm sorry. Uh, If you were to put that assignment dates into a separate form, and then could you embed that into this form as as a link if you're in like the static box? Um, yes, I think that would work without having tried it. I would say that should work. That seems like a lot of effort to uh, just to paint a background color. I did this before when we were on BS3 with, uh, I would add a class to each one of those fields. And then I had a, a number of uh, jQuery assignments that would change the background color of the field and its parent and sometimes its parent of its parent. 
And uh, it was tedious, but I got it done. And now they're on VS5. I wondered if there was a, uh, a new better way to do something like that. Yeah, so well, given the lack of input, I'm going to say nobody on this call has a great instant solution for you. I think what you just mentioned probably would be my approach also. But the um, the embedded form has a possibility as well that I, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. But um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, if I might continue, I have a, one more question, if it's all right. No, these are great. Keep on. It is, uh, it has to do with um, this uh, listing right here. The listing, the data is coming from a uh, stored procedure. And um, I would like to be able to uh, filter by a couple of things. And I, I checked their box for making them filterable. But what uh, happens is it's actually a lot of nothing. I, if I click on these items, it doesn't open up to anything. You don't get choices to, to choose from. I wonder why that is. What I did just now is I removed a, a filter that was that I was manually putting on. Is there um an is there an error at the bottom of the page? Um, or are you logged in as a as a um admin user right now? Not as an admin user. No. Okay, so if you logged in as an admin, what I suspect is you have something on the page that is uh, that's uh, bringing some BS3 styles in. I don't know, uh, Dale or Bogdan, if you agree with that, but that's just my first suspicion. Here I'm logged in as a admin or a super user. I don't see, see any errors. Any... Okay. Is it, would it have something to do with the fact that it is um, bringing the data in with a stored procedure instead of something else? Maybe not with the data access or? Can, can we look at the data source? Uh, Dale, I think you have some sort of background noise. It's me? I think so. Um, no, I don't. I'm just looking at the at the participants to see who was lit up. And that might have been me. I had a fan going on. Let me see if that's any better. No. I'm hearing the background noise as well. Oh, okay, so it's, not you. it's gone now. Yep. Okay. It, it was my modem. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your oh, modem. Yeah. You you uh you, you connecting to CompuServe today? <laughs> exactly. All right, so we've got an ID column, Stack ID. Is Stack ID actually unique? Yes. Yes. Yes, Stack ID is unique. Okay. Um, And in the SQL itself, uh, is that scrolled? Is, is that? Uh, what part of the scroll? I'm sorry, I, I'm unfamiliar in the SQL yeah, query for retrieving items. Is that um, underscore so scrollio? I don't understand the syntax. That's a, that's a SQL stored procedure? Yes, that's just a stored procedure. OK. Um, my question would be is when, well, when you set up an entity and plant an app, you can identify the attributes that, you know, are filterable, sortable, and so on. So does that, where he's just pulling back from a regular old, you know, stored procedure, do those rules then not apply? Let me add a detail to that before answering. Uh, this is a regular SQL Server table, and it is not there. So I, um, 
I think my next step would be to try and reproduce uh, as a stored procedure to see if we have a, we if we have a problem with filtering that comes from stored procedures versus SQL selects. Uh, because that seems to be the thing that is um, unusual here. Uh, is anybody, do you have any others that are based on store procedures that are fi uh, filtering or? Hey Mark, as a test, I don't know how complicated that uh, store procedure is, but can you just unpack the uh, SQL, drop it in there to get the same results and then test it that way? Yeah, I could do that. I probably wouldn't do that with everyone watching, but yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a complicated sort of procedure, which is why it's, you know, built that. Yeah, and yeah, of course. Um, yeah, if if you were inclined to try that, that would be a good one. And alternately, uh, you know, I, it, it may just be, you know, a simple stored procedure would probably give us the same problem if we turn Turn the book query, for example, into a stored procedure, and and then uh, I'm I'm just wondering again if that's if that's the the area where it's acting differently. Um, but I'll take that as as something to try, unless you're gonna unless you're gonna try it the way Matt suggested. Okay, I'm making notes, and that's uh, I'll try this. Thank you, guys. All right, if you. Um, if you'll let me know how that turns out, or if you don't get anywhere with it, I'll I'll work with it uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I know we were working with a. You, there was a question, and I haven't had a chance to look today. This looks like a, a very uh, might have been the same site, but there was a uh, a question about odd oddities in the way that the grid was rendering. Did you sort that out yet? That were rows missing. Um, no, I did not. I didn't want to capitalize on the time here today, but there there is an unanswered issue there. And is that one also based on stored procedure? No, that's a direct connection to a table. Okay. Uh, I can't remember what the, where there it is. This is just a uh, a listing, and it's based right on a table. And um, there's no data coming in. Um, Is there, it, it's uh, based on a SQL query, not a entity? That's correct. Um, the, the SQL query is going directly to a table model. Yeah, let me work on getting that up on the screen. And, uh, okay, and yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. I just, that out. I was, uh, Capitalize on the fact that you had a ticket going. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, hopefully, I'll come back to it. Good. All right. Um, anyone else been holding back with, with something you wanted to talk about? I'm going to skip forward. I teased the the, uh, the fact that I had a ghost story um, when I was working with Zoom and spent far more time on it than I would have liked to admit. Uh, so this is uh, working with the Zoom API. What I found, uh, I, you know, from a process standpoint, when I'm exploring an API, I often use an external tool. Uh, I've mentioned it before, Swagger where you can um, do a get or a post or whatever it is that you need to do uh, to interact with somebody else's API. And it's, it's a nice interactive format. Uh, I th think a lot of people use Postman. And so what I was finding is that I was getting really good results some of the time. If you, uh, for example, said, give me a listing of all of my meetings, uh, and you provided the correct security bearer token, uh, you were getting all that information back. If you turned around and using the same security and following the API documentation said, create a meeting, 
it would return back an odd error um, that was security related and wouldn't do anything. And so I just, based on that, I assumed, well, okay, I was not set up right with security with Zoom. I wasn't passing the right security credentials through it, through the, the Swagger tool. Uh, just it was just never could get anywhere with it. And I finally just decided to use our, instead of using an interactive tool to just try it with this, our server request action and it worked. So I haven't, I never narrowed down what was the difference, but um, apparently the, the tool, the Swagger tool was sending something or doing something that was offending Zoom and causing a failure where just, I mean, and the, so it was the fact that I was trying to do it interactively and learn something and see it visually uh, was the problem. If you just build it in, in faith that it was going to work, it would have worked just fine. So uh, that was that was a couple hours of my life trying to sort that out. Um, yeah. Anyone else have something similar or ghost stories? I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure that um, that uh, probably um, wouldn't have fallen into this trap for very long, but I just, you know, mentioned that I, I experienced the same thing. I was using Postman, which is, you know, a similar type thing. And, uh, um, uh, but I, you know, I got a very clear error back that, um, that my API, was, API wasn't working um, for authentication reasons. And it was, it was really because uh, the, the API was specific to the URL and um, I was trying to, I was trying to do it. I was trying to do it with, uh, with Postman. So that didn't take me long to figure out, but, <laughs> but yeah, and, yeah, I just thought I'd mention that I, you know, it was similar, but yeah, I'm sure not the same thing. Is this, this, that's kind of the um, Heisenberg principle applied to APIs that the act of, playing with a thing changes it. Right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, I mean, okay, I was busy preparing for a Zoom session, so, or, you know, for our, for our cafe. So as soon as I found the answer, I, I just dropped Went past the it yeah. and, and moved on, which I think is all of our temptation to do. Once you have the answer, it's like, okay, just, just don't do that anymore. But uh, I, I really want to get back and, and explore what was the difference. And I suspect there's like a header that's that Swagger yeah. passing that was offending it or, or something like that, that. I know that when I use Postman, they, they, they have a bunch of uh, stuff that they, that they automatically put in. Um, you, mm -hmm. can, you can deselect them, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that sounds possible. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense um, uh, that, you know, uh, the same request from a, uh, from a different tool, one way one works, uh, the other doesn't. There's something that the tool is doing or sending. Uh, there, there's a reason why it, uh, it's failing. I just never got to the reason. I jumped over it. So... The other one that, uh, you know, the other... Another feature we do is uh, dark corners areas of the product that no that nobody goes or that you've never been to before. Uh, my current dark corner is the Stripe API. Um, and I spent an hour today uh, talking with uh, Andre on our internal team about Stripe because we have it enabled on our site, but I've never been there before. And uh, so coming up in cafe next week, we'll be learning about Stripe, signing, uh, shining a little light into uh, that particular area. And uh, I mean, it, it looks to be a ton of things that, that one can do with it, but figuring out how to get set up with Stripe, figuring out there's some very specific configuration things that need to happen in our product to, uh, to make some of the integration go. So we'll just walk through all of that. And, and uh, so that's my current dark corner. I haven't actually good, yeah. I, I think so um and the approach we're going to take is um you know, there are actions that are part of our product and we want to illustrate exactly how to use those and then there's a ton of things that you can do on stripe through their api uh that we haven't implemented as actions so being able to get through their security uh set up, call the APIs to do some of those things. So 
this, I don't know whether it'll be uh, all in one part or whether we'll have to stretch it out to two, but we'll we'll get into uh, get into all that. Stripe, uh, Stripe security appears to be easier uh, in that it, it's um, a stat some static tokens instead of the the uh, OAuth kind of dialogue that you have to have. So um, we shouldn't get quite so hung up in, in what it takes to get that taken care of. So we'll see how far we can get. That'll be. Wednesday. See, I, I keep I keep teasing these alternate on, on Wednesdays. You can hear me mm -hmm. invite people to campfire and on campfire we invite you back to cafe. So Dale, are you going to be putting some sort of a, like a checkout right on? A Absolutely. Yeah, that we'll, page. Yep. And do probably deal. I'm, I, I know we'll deal with subscriptions. Um, we'll probably also try and do just a, a product checkout as well. So is there, you're asking and showing interest, what what particularly do you want to see? Well, um, I've, I've attempted to do things like this before in the past and I ran into the fact I had to be PCI compliant if I put the checkout right on the page. I think I'm using the acronym correctly. And uh, that was a pretty hefty requirement. And so I have chosen in the past and in, in the present, to, uh, to push people out to the, uh, to, I've been using PayPal, to their PayPal checkout page, yeah. which is all PCI compliant. So I, I was wondering how you were handling this way. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, in the same way, it, it transfers out to Stripe and then comes back. That, uh, oh, okay. I'm pretty sure the older, uh, I think we had an, a Stripe action that was, uh, but we now mark it as obsolete. I suspect that that was doing it on our page and, and the same thing with PCI compliance, it's, it becomes a problem. So Right, it, so that makes me very interested. I, I've been using PayPal a lot and uh, sometimes, you know, PayPal, when, when my users go there, PayPal is requiring them to make an account and that um, that's a barrier. People mm -hmm. back off right there. Other times, they it seems like they can get by without making an account, which is um, um, hard to predict and uh, and creates a situation where I don't always have success getting the sale. So I was thinking about switching to Stripe, and I'm happy to see that. Okay, good. Well, uh, I'm interested in it too, uh, less for um, more for being able to understand it and support it as as the questions come in, but. Um, Obviously, it's a different animal than, than PayPal, and so I'll, I'll look particularly at that feature, whether uh, being able to do it without having an account. Some of these things, uh, for example, I know in, in subscriptions that uh, Stripe off also offers a portal for you to be able to manage your subscription, so you as a client can cancel or, or uh, make changes to your subscription. So for that, I suspect it's going to enforce having a Stripe account. But for a, a one pay, I don't, uh, that'll be interesting to see if that's a requirement or not. So we'll learn stuff. Great. All right. Like Matt's got his hand up. Oh yeah, Matt, come back. Okay. It's, it's a rare event, but I'm actually trying to be polite. So <laughs> don't get used to it. Okay, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, this is actually a, a bit of a ghost story, and thanks to Dale, uh, helped me figure it out. So we're trying to create dynamic SQL to pass from, in this case, one grid based on a button push to another and so on. Couldn't get it to work. And, you know, like a lot of us, I've spent an inordinate amount of time uh, trying to figure it out. Anyway, to make a long story short, when you're in um, SQL Management Studio, you create a query, say if you have that, uh, do it properly, they like to put parens around the where clause elements. Well, that doesn't work in, a, in this fashion. Uh, when it was, essentially, I, I ended up with two pieces to the where clause. One had parens around it, one didn't, and uh, and I think the ultimately the, the thing that, and it just simply wouldn't work. Um, and as it turns out, parens in the where clause 
in this case was a no-no as far as um, the token was concerned. That everything was rendering properly. I could, you know, I put the put it up on screen so it was showing properly. The only thing that wasn't showing was the actual token value, which I needed the most. And for some reason, the parens, I'm pretty sure that's what we figured out, Dale, was um, blowing it up. Right. You were trying to set um, a session variable. Correct. With, uh, right. and, and so the, and the, it was the, the set of the variable was failing. So you could, you, outside of this set session, you were able to see the value of a token. And then you were trying to assign that into a, a session variable and the parentheses was blowing up the, the creation of the session variable. So then the session variable didn't have any value. And right. it, it just looks, it, it looks like it should work. There's no question it should work. We had to fool with it and, and just add a, once you simplify the problem. And so in my case, we, we started with, okay, a, a set session works with a value like ABC, but it's not working with the value that you provided. So then we, we tinkered back and forth and found that the parentheses was offending it. And then in luckily in your case, the parentheses weren't even needed. So the, again, the, the, the solution was stop doing that. <laughs> um, versus actually how can we make parentheses work if order of operations was important that have been a problem right but uh we we got around it so uh yep trying to store that where clause in a in a session was was uh not working and yeah when i think this is for me the when when we've spent that kind of time working on something we just have to remind ourselves how much time we spend uh, how much time we save because you know we're not trying to do these things from scratch and how much time it does low code saves time repeat after me low code saves time. <laughs> okay good one um we had a couple of things first of all i'll just mention on our one of the things that we do, uh, let me drop it here. So we have, as a regular feature, contributions to our Campfire website. Anybody that participates in Campfire can be part of the Campfire website. If you are on the call today and you're not part of this and you want to be, uh, send me your email address on the uh, privately on the chat and I will add you to it. But this website is a place where just various techniques for how to do individual small things, some, some of them larger things, but individual types of things that, that you can just use in your own instances. So for example, um, Ben, I'll just take the one on the top of the list. The last contribution was at the end of June. It was a token that lets you get values out of a web config and, uh, and return them as a token. In, in Ben's case, he needed to know uh, whether or not the URL format was advanced or not. And uh, so it, it's the, the code to ex exactly do that. Since the Campfire website is um, something that anybody can sign into and, and uh, look at exactly how it's implemented, you can see the whether it's a token definition or a form and exactly how did they do this thing. So then when you need to, you can, you can repeat it in yours and not have to reinvent the wheel. That's the purpose. That's the spiel. So if, you, uh, um, if you're inclined to contribute something, if you figured something out, uh, that would go into uh, the Campfire website. Um, but yeah, it's probably not too much use unless you actually get to sign into it. So you need to be, to be added as a low code engineer. Um, so no new contributions, that's that news. And then uh, there are a couple of new feature requests and I have them over here someplace. Um, and I just thought I would mention, and there's always an opportunity to, uh, um, if you wanna lobby for votes on your favorite feature request, you can do that here. But uh, Peter contributed a couple in this last week. Uh, one talking about an action to execute a button on the page. Um, 
so and I just had I hadn't even read the, the thought behind that. Let's see if there's any detail. Um, Peter doesn't happen to be here to uh, advocate for this one, but so it, so you can add. Uh, you, uh, this is one way to, to, to run a button. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, Mark, you have a, a, a simpler JavaScript syntax that you've been using to execute buttons. Yeah, there's something that's a little bit shorter. Yeah. Um, I could add it in there, but uh, I think it's this is a valid request. I, I oftentimes do the same thing. I uh, Peter's not here to defend himself, but I will uh, defend him. You know, oftentimes I, I need to get an action um, into the form, um, and I want to be able to call that action without uh, without clicking on a button. So I have to make a button and then call it with JavaScript. So it would be much nicer if there was an easier way to execute actions anytime it was needed. So I'm a little uh, I'm a little dense on this use case. Help me to understand if uh, it, it's basically out of uh, you're, you're triggering a button, but what kinds of thing, what kind of events are, are you trying to trigger the button from? So is it JavaScript? Sure, like uh, you could have a drop down uh, field and you want to execute an action after the user makes a choice in the drop down. So that's a different use case there because th there, there you're saying if we could just execute actions, um, on an event like that. And I think we've talked about that on this call before, the ability to maybe to possibly execute actions on a, um, have that as an option in the, um, in the, in the uh, on-click event for, uh, for um, fields. Yeah, I that remember talking about it. I yeah, don't yeah. Know if that's that, been uh, recorded here or not. That's, I would love it. Yeah, that would be a really cool thing. Definitely, I can see the use case for that. Um, but I think here with, uh, with uh, this request here, He's talking about just adding an action that could call a button, but it seems like that would either be on a button that you're clicking, or it would have to be in the initialization events, because um, those are the places where we can call actions now. Well, exactly. That's yeah. why I was kind of struggling with, uh, you know, where where is this going to get called? Um, but from a design uh, on on that other. Uh, right now we have on click that you uh, um, on click is connected with is an event connected with a lot of our, our form elements and so uh, but it, it gives you a chance to run javascript so you're saying the other thing and I, I agree i think we've talked about it before would be to have be able to put an action stack uh connected with the on click is that what you were suggesting, Patrick? Yeah, yeah and I think, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's different than what Peter is suggesting. But you know, I, I did, um, I did do something. What he is suggesting here too, when I wanted to get the fingerprint, the device fingerprint, which only happens on form submit, but I wanted to get it on form open, and so I made a button that would submit the form, and then on form open, I needed to call the button. So that it would submit, so that I could get the fingerprint, and that mm -hmm. sounds like similar to what he's trying to do there. I mean, that's a use case for what he's asking for. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you did contribute so, that one. Run a button on formal. Yeah, that's that's in there. Um, so I don't know what he's trying to do, but I had to do something similar. Well, good. So. I I, I know that there's opportunities going to be coming up that I'll get a chance to talk to Peter. So we'll dig in a little bit more on that one and, and uh, make sure we get a good definition. And then um, add an action that sets or adds a query string variable. So this is something we can do pretty easily in, in JavaScript, but um, yeah, because we you can use it, um, you can do this to add 
content as a JavaScript, but talking about doing it as a core action. Um, so it's possible, for example, to do it if you if you actually use a redirect, uh, you can add query string values into the URL, but that's going to make your page refresh. Mm -hmm. so this would be manipulating the, the query string without. And the thing is, actions are uh, server side. Um, I don't know. I don't know enough about the the architecture to know whether this is possible, but I could see I could see the case for it. Well, yeah, but it, yeah, this would be a, a, we do have client side actions like an open form and pop up um, that sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I can see the value of this, um, uh, and and I think at the same time it, uh, we should be able to. Uh, um, Delete a query string param. Um, I think we talked about that on this call quite a while ago um, as well, because there is a way to delete a query string param, but it's a little bit more complicated. We don't have a direct function to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can definitely see you know, the use case for this. Yeah. Well, and, and there's many of us, and I'm one of many of us that don't do JavaScript. It's not native to me, you know, so then right. uh, if, we, if we do them as actions, then it, it just provides that a little bit more insulation. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep. So we're chatting away here. Um, Matt says Wistia. Anybody done Wistia? I don't even know what that is. What is that, Matt? What is Wistia? <laughs> yeah. It's a um, it's a video service, um, you know, like a YouTube channel sort of thing, but a, a private paid thing. Mm -hmm. And it's got an API. It looks doesn't look particularly different from what I was seeing on the low code cafe with uh, uh, the integration you were doing. But if anybody's done one, that would be great. I'd love to be able to learn but uh yeah doesn't sound it though if you don't even know what it is probably you haven't integrated with it i'm just saying <laughs> not yet you know we we've done uh I, I don't know how many integrate anything videos we've done in a variety of stuff and if it basically if it has an api we we uh usually can do it it can be done but uh interesting um Curious, the video host with the most. <laughs> cool. Um, well, in my spare time, I'll check on that one. Take a look at the API and see what, what we can do with that. Uh, Making notes here. Right. Um, what else? I guess we've, we're about at the top of the hour. If there's anything that, uh, any last, last request, now's a good time to do that. Otherwise we'll adjourn to uh, Afterglow. Update that slide. We'll do this again next week. It's not going to be July 22nd next week. Uh, but with that, I will say happy low coding. You guys, I appreciate you showing up week by week. This is a good session. And uh, the hour went by fast. Uh, hang around for a few minutes if you, if you have the inclination. All right. Thank you all. Have a good week.